has an incredible power to heal. Everyone smiles in the same language, and that is what brings us all together. Namaste delegates, on behalf of the G20 Interfaith Forum, in collaboration with MIT World Peace University and the Interfaith Alliance for Safer Communities, I, Vedant Kulkarni, welcome you to this magnificent Nelson Mandela Hall. Okay. This remarkable symbol symbolizes our shared commitment to global harmony, unity, and the pursuit of peace. May we have the honor of welcoming our esteemed dignitaries who will join us in the symbolic act of ringing the bell. And as we ring the bell, let its sound remind us of the unity and the peace that connects us all. I request all the delegates to please join each other in ringing the bell. Thank you, everyone. Now, I request the technical team to please play the theme film on the topic of peace building and social peace. This session is based on peace building and social peace. Religious communities have deeply embedded traditions for reconciliation and building peaceful communities. Prevention is an essential focus when talking about peace building. The voices of women and children are not... This session is based on peace building and social peace. Religious communities have deeply embedded traditions for reconciliation and building peaceful communities. Prevention is an essential focus when talking about peace building. The voices of women and children are not currently present where decisions are being made about peace building and conflict prevention. We need a deeper analysis into the cause of increasing violence across the globe. In this session, we will discuss issues pertaining to peace building and social peace. Thank you, everybody.
Now I would like to invite Dr. Vaibhav Zoshi and ask him to please felicitate our moderator, our moderator, <laughs> Honorable Rachel Mimer, founder and CEO of Bellwether International. Now I would like to ask Dr. Zoshi to please felicitate Honorable Audrey Kitagawa, President and Founder the, for the International Academy of Multicultural Corporation and President of the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family. Now I would like to ask Dr. Zoshi to please felicitate Honorable Peter Francois, an associate professor at Oxford University. Now I would like to ask Dr. Mandar Bapat sir to please felicitate Dr. Priyanka Rupadhyay, UNESCO Chair for Peace and Intercultural Understanding and Distinguished Professor and Senior Advisor, MIT World Peace University. I would now like to ask Dr. Bapat to please felicitate Professor Mohammad Gulres, Vice Chancellor, Aligarh Muslim University. Now I would like to ask Dr. Bapat to please felicitate Honorable Dr. Edison Samraj, Director, Educational Department, Southern Asia Division, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and Maldives. Now, I would like to ask Dr. Bapat to please felicitate Dr. Sanjay Upadhyay, mentor and chief advisor, MIT World Peace University, Pune. Thank you, everyone. Now, without any further ado, I would like to request Dr. Uh, Honorable Rachel Maima, ma'am, to please take over the session. Great. Thank you so much. Um, first, a massive thank you to all the organizers for this historical event. 
and to do it in the World Peace Dome. What an honor, and I'm so honored to be with each of my panelists. Um, they are incredible individuals, and if you look at your booklet, you get a small glimpse. A title doesn't tell you everything, but it tells you a lot. These are prestigious scholars, advocates, activists, and I hope that you'll take the time to speak to them and get to know them after this session. Uh, to start, I just want to get a sense of who's in the room. So raise your hand if you're currently a student at MIT WPU. Fantastic. Raise your hand if you've come representing a nonprofit organization or an NGO. And raise your hand if you're here in an academic capacity. Okay, wow, great. That's really helpful. And raise your hand if you don't fall into one of those categories. <laughs> okay, we got everyone. That's great. Um, the topic of our session today is peace building, which has a history of its own. I think every academic here, we could go into the philosophy of whether peace is affirmative or responsive. We could discuss so many things. Um, but what I want to start by discussing is actually the etymology of the word itself. So peace comes from a really interesting heritage. The root is Latin, and it means to fasten or to bind together. That's the original meaning of the word from the Latin root, uh, P-A-G. It then evolved from binding or fastening into a formal agreement, P-A-G. It then evolved into pais, which is a reference to some of the romantic languages, Anglo-French and Spanish, which means reconciliation. And then finally, in the mid-12th century, we get the word itself, peace, which means freedom from civil and other violent disorder. So think about the combination of those words. Fasten, agree, reconcile, freedom. That tells a story. And that's a story we're going to unpack with the lens of now peace building. And the building part is really important, especially in the context that we're going to discuss today. Peace building is defined as the development of constructive relationships that aims to resolve injustice in nonviolent ways and to transform the structural conditions that generate deadly conflict. So peace building is fundamentally about creating relationships, creating relationships that tackle the injustice in the world. So the first question I wanna to pose to my panels, just to give you a sense of their specialties, which they'll speak to, and to, to give an overview of this very important topic, is what does peace building mean in your individual context? Give us a little bit of your personal definition as it relates to your work and your expertise. And we'll start on the end with uh, Professor Mohamed Gulriz. Just turn on, just turn on your mic um, at the top there. I think uh, your question goes on two sides. One is peace building and another is social peace. Peace building uh, has a component which is normally applied after a war has taken place. And this has to be seen in the context of, you know, international border wars, you know. And what measures the government is take or is taking to mitigate or to resolve the conflict. So this is in a broader framework that we say that peace building is a wider concept wherein the peace, the confidence, uh, social peace is internally, you know, acceptable wherein we are involving the kind of a governance, the system, the system delivery, and it should have confidence of the people so that, you know, the internal conflicts can be mitigated and we can look forward to it. Yeah, brilliant. So there's this element of war. It, it's following war or some other state violence. And then, as you mentioned, there's a government and institutional Institution focus. Institution building, yes. That's wonderful. Um, <coughs> please add Professor Rupadaye. Did I get Thank it? You. Close? Uh, see, I have my problems of somebody uh, who has been uh, studying and understanding 
peace and peace building for a long time. I mean, this long time is not an important thing. But I have many visions of this particular discourse. Uh, for instance, uh, in my own work and understanding, peace has to be seen in diverse context. I mean, peace is seen as shanti in the Indian con context or the ancient Sanskrit context. In Mandarin, it, is, it has a different connotation. Arabic, it has a different connotation. So that is just the etymology of it. But otherwise, also in terms of interpretation, as we know, that peace has undergone tremendous transference from negative peace to positive peace and so on and so forth. Now, the understanding that we begin with is that peace is the absence of both direct and indirect violence and therein the cultural violence, structural violence and rest goes. Now, the peace building. So, the same thing is with the peace building. There was a time, I mean, peace building started surfacing somewhere in the 90s, especially with the agenda for peace, where peace building was seen as a post-conflict activity something that begins when the conflict ends. But now the United Nations, which has uh, kind of uh, been steering this discourse, has more or less given up on this concept. And now they are using a concept, concept sustaining peace. And basically it's a peace building with an argument that peace building begins with the prevention, as you said, the prevention of conflict itself. It's not a post-conflict activity. So to me, I think the words and the concepts, they also assume new dimension in course of time. And here in the context of interfaith or interreligious understanding, it has also taken, evolved its, its nature and meaning. So sorry for distracting the debate, but essentially now in my own writing and my work, which I do a lot for UNESCO, we use the term sustaining peace, which is an argument that peace building begins not, it doesn't wait for the conflict to end, but it starts with the everyday life. We can talk more about it, but at this point, this is it. That's an absolutely beautiful context, especially the way you've redefined it for us. It's not just a singular event in reaction to something, but sustainability. That's a word we hear in many contexts. We think about sustainable climate response and sustainable humanitarian response, and now you've introduced this language to help us think about sustaining peace. Well, thank you, and in a way I would like to start my couple of minutes from exactly that point to which I agree. I also don't think peace starts when the conflict or the war or the violence has ended. My own interest is very much in a way on how to prevent the conflict uh, the violence to start and in many ways that's another definition of saying it's about sustaining peace. I'm interested in what makes societies resilient, cohesive, peaceful and basically it's that avoidance of uh, violence. The second thing I, I would like to pick up or add on is that uh, the word context has already been mentioned once or twice and I'm only the third speaker uh, in the sense that um, it is understood that peace is a complicated or a complex uh, matter uh, which has links to societal well-being, uh, to religion, uh, equality and so on and so forth. But there is also a danger in that, that you almost um, create a situation in which you say the context is so specific that um, our country or our situation can only, is, is unique and can only be understood if you know the specific context. Now, I think there is a lot of value in that, and uh, I think people should focus on specific contexts and providing information there. My own interest lies not there. I'm, I can't claim credibly, or I also don't want to claim credibly, that I know one specific context very well. What I do is I'm asking questions which are pertaining to peace, is uh, what happens if you scale up, if you aggregate all those specific contexts, if you, add, if you look at a thousand examples, can we detect some more fundamental laws in here, some uh, trends and so on and so forth. So I try to, to, to place peace in between that, that play between the very unique, the very specific, and at the same time, almost a human level. Audrey, maybe you can speak to some of the dimensions of peace building. I know that's a huge part of your work. 
So what would you add to both the definition, but also thinking more about the logistical, what does peace building really entail? Well, thank you so much, and hello, everyone. It's my privilege to be with all of you and our August panelists. So I uh, have my definitions really that arise from the United Nations because I was an advisor to the Undersecretary General for the Office of Children and Armed Conflict. So I was an international advocate for children affected by war. So the language of the United Nations that guides the peace building activities uh, was pretty well developed uh, re in relatively recent years, like for example, in 2007, the United Nations, the Secretary General's Policy Committee actually defined peace building as a range of measures target, targeted to reduce the risk of lapsing or relapsing into conflict by strengthening national capacities at all levels of conflict management and to lay foundations for sustainable peace and sustainable development. Now, with respect to Rachel's particular uh, inquiry, you know, peace building itself with respect to the structures has expanded to include many different dimensions. So it is, again, here's that word complex, and it entails uh, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration. This reintegration was particularly uh, important for child soldiers to be reintegrated into their communities and to be able to rebuild governmental, economic, and civil society institutions. So the concept uh, of inter the international community through the UN uh, Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali in 1992, he did a very important report called An Agenda for Peace. And you can look that up, and I would commend all of you to read about it. And it defined post-conflict peace building as an action to identify and support structures which will tend to strengthen and solidify peace in order to avoid a relapse into conflict. And somewhere along the line, uh, the, the other half of uh, today's title is uh, social peace. So we will get into that, I'm sure, Rachel. And you know, what are the aspects of social peace? And I think you have a particular article that you wanted us to make reference to as part of the panel discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Audrey. Like I said, I'm surrounded by the A team. If we were making a, a national cricket team for peace building, this is the starting lineup right here. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, over to you to either comment on peace building or as we, as we think specifically about the host nation, can you give some examples of peace building in the Indian context and core elements that you think contribute to the definition? Hello friends, uh, good afternoon. The most difficult audience post lunch to talk on peace. The peace is, uh, I feel it's a contented mind with a smiling face. So right now we need smile on your faces also. Otherwise, I will not be in a position to put your faces on Facebook. Is it? So there was an English teaching teacher entered the class and asked the boy, in which state you stay? He said, Maharashtra. Boy answered. Then she said, tell me the spelling. The boy said, in that case, Goa. I always feel, as far as peace is concerned, there are five steps. One is individual, then is family then the society, then the nation, and then we'll talk about the world peace. First, am I having a peace in my mind? That is the question. And that question can be solved with the, this sentence of contented mind. And that we are searching for. And smile is the shortest distance between two people. I have attended a number of conferences on peace, but I have never seen people laughing uh, and uh, cracking jokes and enjoying the session. That brings a peace because as far as the faith is concerned, uh, last line of my uh, initial comment is this, that uh, there is not a conflict in sp the word spiritual. The conflict is in ritual and not spiritual. And that is the uh, question today. Uh, if I pray in a, the Indian way, 
with putting my both hands in this position. The moment your eyes look at this position of my hands, you label me as an Islam person. But if I put these hands like this and say, Om Bhadram Karnevi Shunyam Deva Bhadram Pashyamakshya Virjatra Sire Ranga Istrushtu Vasa Stanu Vihi This is the way if I go for Shanti Mantra, then there is a confusion. I feel uh, the fate is same for everyone that is COVID has taught us. Fate is same. The faith is different. So we have to, under the umbrella of uh, interfaith dialogue, we have to look on the very basic uh, mental contended situation of everyone. And that is what I do in MIT as a happiness coach. Thank you so much. And you've touched on a really important point, which is we used to talk about conflict resolution and peace building, and now we talk about conflict transformation. That's the direction that all the scholarship goes and what we do on the ground. And what you've touched on so beautifully is this idea of inner peace. Peace building starts yes. with the inner yes. peace and then builds outwards. And yes. I think that uh, MIT WPU is modeling that. It, you're yes. modeling what it looks like to build that inner peace yes. and then extend that peace to neighbor yes. and then extend that to nation. The, the tribute which I have with me as a peace I distribute it. The moment you distribute tribute, you start getting peace in your mind. Beautiful. Dr. Samraj, you have an educational expertise, and you've also seen a lot of the definitions we've been talking about play out in local communities in India. Can you comment on first your educational perspective on peace building, and then some of the difficulties you see in India regarding peace building? That you've, ex that you've seen in your work. Thank you, Rachel, for giving me this time to reflect upon this noble theme, shaping the world peace and sustainable development through interfaith harmony. I think what you have is envisioned is basically, as all our eminent speakers spoke about, that there is a need for it, but everybody talks about it in the form of uh, a rhetoric and um, nobody goes into the how and the why and we stop at the place where we say we need to have peace we need to have peace we need to have contentment but what is it that makes it happen what is it that enables us to experience it those questions are normally not answered so today I want to present to this very distinguished audience that peace is a state of mind. And when you want to experience it, there should be one element that brings it well. And there is only one word that brings it well, and that is faith. There is a certain amount of disorientedness to life itself by our young generation disoriented because of distractions, distractions because of disillusionment in their own lifestyle, and that leads to a certain level of disturbedness in terms of their minds. And violence, in my opinion, is a deviant behavior because of its prejudice and biases and dogmas that dominate our thinking. And uh, when you don't have a state of mind that has the right framework within itself defined, then you have the end result, violence. You are talking about the result, but you're not talking about the cause. What do we do to remove it? How do we have that taken out? And how do we manage this state of mind, sustain it in the mind and off the mind and for the mind? Now that's the challenge and I, as an educator, I have taken this challenge as a serious challenge because I am dealing with 200,000 students with 300 institutions and seven colleges and two universities. My primary objective is to bring transformation of the mind. And that, is mean, that means give them peace. Peace of mind, not peace about the mind. Peace of mind. So for that, that's the only one answer to the question. And that will take a long time for me to explain, but I'll just mention that word, Rachel and that is integration. Integration is the missing link of both our curriculum and our polity and our culture. 
and I'm writing a star, I'm going to present an article on this, the story of zero and the journey to one, in which I am explaining why is this world without peace is because we landed in zero, but we don't know how to take the journey to one. And that is where I am making this historic and a necessary condition that unless we start from the experience of knowing where we are, we can't take this journey to one. So I need to explain the story of zero and the journey to one, which is actually the, the crux of the Interfaith Summit that we are all heading to. Thank you so much. Um, I want to pause now that we've set the landscape of peace building and invite you to do something in this session. You have the context, you've got a glimpse into the skill and knowledge of our panelists. My invitation for you between now and when we finish this panel is to write down something that you learn about peace and post it on your social media account, tagging the IF20 and the G20 and then any of the representative organizations on this panel. Because where we're headed next is putting peace into practice. And if you do that one thing, you will be building peace just by coming to this session. Okay, so is everyone willing to accept that challenge? Write down one thing and then you can either post it during this session or directly afterwards. So that's the transition from talk to walk. Look at the title of our session, Peace Building and Social Peace. Do you notice anything about that title? Peace is on either side. What's in the middle? Building and social. So let's talk about those two elements. How do we build peace through social institutions such as the interfaith movement, religious freedom, and religious institutions. As uh, earlier I mentioned that you know, social peace is a confidence among the population of the right. government. You know, one community should not feel that it is more authorized and other should not feel that it is deprived of the basic rights. A society where there is a confidence in the system, a government which is delivering, you know. And as pointed out earlier also, you know, a delivered government which has a sustainable, you know. And this gives a confidence in the post-recovery. After, you know, conflict has taken place, this gives a confidence to the people that they are a people who are going to take care of them. I'm giving you just one example, you know. The 9-11 incident took place and you know, it, it was given a zero you know, ground. Now it is termed as ground zero mosque. You know. <laughs> now this is a, 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 a claim and you, know, you are discharging or you know, blaming the whole community. A segment of the population has done something and now whole of the community they are feeling you know, deprived. I, I'm also you know, making a reference that you know, the Bush used to give the reference of you know, this, you know, rogue community, failed state, you know, state, people cannot, you know, fail, you know, it is the system which has failed, you know, rogue state, excess of evil. I think these type of things give, you know, lack of confidence among the community. I think a governance which is, you know, transparent, which has a confidence of the people and which is implementing certain policies which we give direct benefit to the people without making I think this is a social piece. Thank you. Two words I want to touch on and then build on this. No special status. Yes. That's a really important <coughs> concept that's debated. If we give special status to one human right over another, if we give special status to one group over another, it's really hard to build peace. So do different groups have different needs? Yes, and in that sense, there, there are specials in, in the community. But how we balance that special status becomes really important in, in peace building and social peace. And then the second word that you used, confidence in the system. Peace building is fundamentally about trust. And if we don't build that trust between each other, in our communities, with our governments, it doesn't matter how much money you put towards peace building. Without trust, there is no peace. 
there is no social peace. So please, continue the discussion. What stuck out to you from his comment or other comments that have been made? I mean, honestly, so much to share, and one is relishing the discussion. Uh, I was just thinking about, I'm not telling you what I did in my own long academic pursuits, but we did a volume for UNESCO a couple of years back, and the title was Long Walk of Peace Towards Conflict Prevention. And why am I mentioning this? Uh, because at the time of uh, the final delivery, there were some people at UNESCO headquarters who said that it should be long walk to peace. And I said there was a big debate, and I, I stood my ground. It's very difficult to deal with UNESCO bureaucracy, let me say. But I stood my ground and I said it has to be long walk of peace. And then I quoted Gandhi that there is no end station like Gandhi, uh, peace. Peace is the way we live. Peace is the way we live every day in life. And uh, so that is where, I, I mean, the start of that volume, I just try to recall, and I, I wrote, which is nothing new, and several hundred people might have written it, that peace is a journey of discovery. It's a journey of discovery, it, and going back to the point you said about assigning different values and not assigning different values to different strata in the society, the argument is here, that it's a personal journey which has to be done in a social context. I mean, it was not, I mean, sometimes we make a binary between inner peace and social peace, which I think is very deliberate. And not really deliberate at times, it is kind of uh, academic negligence that, that we do this. I mean, look at the people who talked about inner peace, Vivekanand. He said that, can you remain hungry and still talk about peace? Certainly not. There is a direct relationship. Mahatma Gandhi, he said, whatever is good for you to do must be good for the society. But they always included, Gandhi, for instance, he's a postal of peace, as we know. He talks about, he's the first one who gave the concept of structural violence to the world. It's least, it's little realized. People think it is Johan Galtung who did it. But Johan Gal Galtung, in his own writing and my personal deliberation with me, he said that he learned it from Gandhi, especially when Gandhi wrote that hate the sin, not the sinner. So he goes into the structure. And Gandhi was very particular. The structural violence like hunger, discrimination you mentioned, position, disempowerment of women, child labor, rest of it, they're very fundamental to do away if we are talking. Just talking about peace doesn't help. So inner peace, you can be very peaceful. You can meditate for hours, which is wonderful. It can give you that strength, but the society has to, you have to look into the structure and also counter them. And also important thing, as I mentioned in passing in my last intervention, is the cultural violence. What we don't describe as violence, this domination, this different behavior, etc., they are not seen as a, a viol an act of violence. And this, according to Gandhi, according to Galtung, and people call me peace researcher, I can share with you, there's a general agreement that there is something like that embedded in the language. We certain behavior we reckon with as, we do not reckon as nonviolent and they have to be reckoned as nonviolent. So, so much to say, but you know, as I said that I look at this question increasingly linked with the question of social slash human development one, and secondly, the question of justice. I mean, to me, if you ask me, I don't visualize any peaceful situation unless there is justice. Justice which touches not one, not the state leaders or the borders or the states, but as uh, my friend Sanjay Upadhyay said about family, about how, what happens, the peace in the family to community and rest. So all, there's a lot of thing, but peace needs to be understood as a one word language. In our own academic scholastic writing, we say that nobody is opposed to peace, but people use it differently. Many countries attack others on the name of peace, isn't it? That's, isn't that what we're seeing? And they equate the peace of graveyard with peace. You know, you silence your opponents and then claim there is peaceful in Northeast, in Southeast, in Belgium, in uh, Rwanda, and rest of it. So I become emotional about it, but I think peace, that's why I think that people who talk too much about bringing peace through simple me you know, mechanism needs to remember that it is a very wide set of people. It's a very empowering concept. So need to be very careful about when we use the term peace building or sustaining peace. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, let's make this a little personal before Peter shares his comments. I want you to think of someone that you disagree with. This isn't very hard for me because I disagreed with someone at lunch. Think of <laughs> someone you disagreed with. Can you picture the conversation you were having? There's a tendency in our society, as soon as we encounter tension and disagreement, what do you do? Run away. Leave it. Don't talk about that. We're, cut, we're gonna shut down this conversation. We're not discussing this anymore. Is that peace building? Is that the long journey you just described? I loved your wording. It's a journey of discovery. And that journey is going to require you to hold tension in your life. And sometimes in your heart, in your inner soul, we have to hold tension long enough for it to resolve, right? So as we think about the long walk of peace, as we think about the journey of discovery, this is not just a conversation about people out there in the world. This is a conversation about us. And if the people in this room can't hold tension to build peace, there's no hope of this happening on a national or a global scale. So think about those disagreements, and maybe Peter will shed light and the others will share, shed light on, well, what do we do when we encounter that tension and we can't resolve it? What happens then? That could be a foreshadowing of things to come. But I just wanted to point that out. Peter, to you. Thank you so much. And I, and I will pick up, in a way, your shift of attention to the individual. So very often when I move into a new field or a new area I would like to study, I ask myself the question, how are groups involved in that phenomenon I want to study and how are individuals involved? So basically, um, and I do feel that if you are working in an area where you combine both perspectives, that's where most of the interesting stuff happens. And I think in a way, the world of peace building and also your original question was about how to work social in there is much better at focusing on what groups contribute towards peace building or peace sustaining. In the sense that, oh, in a certain society you have several groups, whether based on, on faith or on other uh, divisions, and you say, well, how can we make them cooperate more harmoniously, right? And I think there's uh, a long standing history and interest of, in the world of peace, focusing on those interactions between groups. Um, definitely interfaith dialogue is to be situated on that level. However, in your uh, more recent remark, you, you focused the shift to the individual and said, what can I do? And obviously this brings a whole new set of questions into play. And there, increasingly, the attention is on, well, how to break the cycle? We need to focus on youth, we need to focus on education, and you need to focus on leadership. But I, again, I don't think it's necessarily good enough to, to then all run that direction and just do that. And then I maybe in 20 years time we will be sitting here and the next me will say, oh, peace building and the role of the individual is very well understood, but you have that thing there called groups, what is that actually doing? You know, it, it's basically carrying both concepts, both dimensions, both levels in your, in your work with you and also in a way in, in, in your practical work because you shifted to practical. It's, obvious, no, no, it's not obviously, but it's more common to focus away from talking to actually doing if you focus on youth education and so on. Now I'll give you one example of um, a study that we are doing in my group uh, which focuses at border crossing leadership. So it is really using that concept and focusing on accepting there are many leaders and they come in many different uh, you know, forms and formats and profiles, but which ones have in the past actually not simply voiced the, the worries, the, 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 if, you know, the commitments of its constituency, but actually have done that at the same time, have listened and transcended that and engaged with other uh, constituencies as well directly, right? That kind of cross-border, uh, border-crossing leadership profiles are so sought after. Now, if you put them in peace negotiation context, if you put them in peace building, are they making a difference or not? So this is one of the areas that we want to study. So it's definitely much about groups. It's about peace building in countries and so on, but also about individuals. Divine Mother, over to you. I thank you so much. What we witness oftentimes in these discussions is the macro 
that we all want to address in terms of global governance and the structures of governance that can maximize the possibilities of peace or the policies of any particular country that lead the country and its people to war. So that's a macro level. At the same time, this, this simultaneity of the need to look within the individual. So that's the micro level. And I think uh, when we talk about transformation, while we want to see it on a large scale, uh, the actual practice and the experience of transformation on the individual level must be a personal experience. And it is often the case that we find, I mean, the aspect of the values and the practicing of the values, the ethics, and Rachel also said something very important that you need trust, you know, in order to really have peace. So here we have, you know, what are the factors that create trust within the individual? And she mentioned having the tension uh, at lunch with somebody that she didn't agree with. Every moment that we live, we are dealing on the micro level as individuals. At the same time, as members of civil society and the human family, we also want to address the macro level. So this simultaneity of action is going on all the time. So I wanted to give a shout out to UNESCO, which is a co-sponsor of this event. And the preamble of UNESCO is a very wonderful preamble. And it declares that since wars begin in the minds of men, so that is the micro level, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be considered. So at all times, because we are in particularized form and structure, you cannot escape dealing with the micro level. And hopefully, it is the collective consciousness of the minds of everyone that can be shifted towards peace that will create the outer reflection of peace in the bigger world. So that, hopefully, is the goal. And uh, in 1945, when UNESCO was created, it was created to respond to the firm belief of nations forged by two world wars in less than a generation that political and economic agreements are not enough to build lasting peace. And peace must be established on the basis of humanity's moral and intellectual solidarity. So here you have it, the bringing together of the micro and the macro in one preamble, but it also speaks to how we move as individuals in the bigger world. And this is an inescapable kind of duality that we exist in, and the ultimate goal is to come to that state of transcendence. And that requires the inner assiduous work of each individual in the sacred journey that we all are taking part in. And to build this trust that uh, Rachel was talking about that you need trust or there can be no peace. That again, the establishment of trust depends on the degree to which you yourself are aligned in your own values and whether you trust yourself and therefore whether the people that you have within your life, you have that kind of relationship with because you trust that they have integrity, that they are honorable, that they practice the good values and our ethical people. Now, that's a pretty tall order, and we work on it every day that we live. So peace is a very complex subject indeed, because it is a study at all times of the self. It's hard to confront ourselves, uh, increasingly hard to confront ourselves in a globalized world. The idea that what you've just read from the preamble, so beautiful, that we need to create defenses of peace in the minds of men, women, children. How do we create defenses of peace in the mind? I want to raise and highlight that what you consume will affect your mind. And to think that we will have global peace 
without a critical self-awareness of what people are consuming on social media, which predominantly affects the mind, is ignorance. And each of us needs to seriously evaluate what are we consuming in the mind. In the United States, the way that this translates is, what news are you watching? In Europe, this may translate, what is your source of entertainment? In India, what social media? India is the number one consumer of Facebook, more users than any nation in the world. And this, this is not just India specific, this is a global thing, but every single person, every nation needs to be seriously asking themselves, what does the mind consume? And if you're consuming violence, if you're consuming misinformation, if you're consuming rhetoric that makes you think that you have special status over other people who believe differently than you, if you're consuming things that are antithetical to peace, we will not have a peaceful world. And so I'm so grateful that you raised that point, Andre. Um, let's continue this discussion. Dr. Sanjay, your thoughts, insights, or if you want to take us in a new direction. Uh, actually, uh, I always feel that uh, am I enjoying my life given by this Mother Nature? In Indian philosophy, there are four different types of deaths are mentioned. The first death is, is a daily death. The moment you go to bed every day, you do not know what you do after you go to sleep and you do not know after you do what you do after the death. So that first death is called daily death. The second death is called the difference of state. I was a child, then my childhood died, then I be 24 by 7. Because in the morning I am so happy and peaceful because I am alive. When I get up, the first I thank that Almighty is saying that I am alive and that's, I start distributing immediately. Because I feel that if I enjoy my liveliness, then only I can distribute what the meaning of peace is to somebody else. If I have a tension, the problem is with our intention and not tension. So every mind is working in a different way. When Dr. Vishwanath Kara tried to install Mahatma Gandhi's statue and Gautam Buddha's statue in UNESCO Paris, UNESCO Paris refused. They said Mahatma Gandhi is a statesman. He is not a messenger of peace. And what you, have, you are expecting to install in Paris office is the art of peace, is a piece of an art just. The question is immediately the perspective changed. And this perspective got changed due to different geographical situations all over the world. So I always feel the human culture gets derived out of geographical structure, it's a geographical influence human mind where we are working right now. And so we have to listen because in the human body we feel that ears is the only organ which you cannot close by order. All other four organs of knowledge you can close by order. If you don't want to see the movie you can close your eyes. If you have a diabetes you can stop your eating sugar. If the thing is hot you will stop your touch. But then you cannot stop ears. Now I am still listening the sound behind of this uh, machine. I have to listen to it, but I have to train my mind to not to attend that sound. So I always feel that when I want peace, somebody asked me that, sir, I want peace. I said, you write down that line on the paper. And he wrote that line on the paper that I want peace. Then what should I do now? I said, remove I. Out of these three words, remove I, that I am doing this, I am doing this, I did that, I am th doing this, remove I. Then said, okay, remove. Then remove want also. I want this, I want that, I want that, remove want also. Then he said, yeah, I did that. Now read the last word, that is peace. So you remove I, remove want, then you get peace. Till that day, you won't get the peace. And this structure is to be taught to an individual. You cannot teach it to the mob. It's an individual process. We have to train as far as the world. As rightly uh, Mr. said that, what, what is the solution to it? We are just discussing and elaborating the question, but the solution to this is I have to go to every each and each person and tell him that take the life sincerely and not seriously because birth, you never asked your birth. 
So it wasn't your choice. Death is not your choice. You have got only traveling between these two stations, birth and death. Travel makes you smile. So go ahead. That will bring everyone together. The mother nature has standardized human body. Is it not everybody sitting here, anybody is having two noses? No, one nose, two eyes, two ears, two hands. So in your mother nature has standardized human body. Now it is our duty as the intellectual, like she rightly said, that intellectual job is to be done to standardize human mind and to come together whatever the most basic ingredient required. And that require, I still feel as a happiness coach, that ingredient is smile. I don't need, I don't want this man that I, sh I know this person. Without knowing also, I should be in a position to smile, hi, how are you? Just make him realize that he's alive. Then he will make you. So what goes around comes around. So start with an individual in this hall. Anything else we can meet? You can meet me after the session. <laughs> I'll make you smile. Are, are you by chance a professor? <laughs> I love the, I love how you're tying things together for us in such a beautiful way and reminding us that there are a lot of resources built into humanity, including the biology of our bodies, right? Thinking about our ears and our bodies as vehicles for peace. That's, that's pretty radical. Think about the world we live in, which is constantly disparaging the body, particularly the female body. And in every society, I can't think of a single society, where we don't degrade our own bodies. But yet you're, you're presenting a radical idea, which is our bodies are vehicles for peace. Our ears are vehicles for peace. Uh, Dr. Edison, what would yeah. you add on? Oh, yeah. So yeah, quick comment. Sorry, just one line. The, I request everyone to uh, give importance to the ears and not eyes. What you're doing on social media and mobile and everything, we are making our eyes dominant now. Don't do that. And ears are becoming dormant. But the human ears are directly related with your behavior. In the house also we say, I told him 10 times, but he doesn't listen to me. What is that listen to me? Why it comes to the ears? The ears, you cannot close it. And so human behavior is directly gets influenced by ears. So I request everyone to go for uh, listening to more and more. Sanskrit it is called Bhavishrata. And then you attend the peace the way I have attended. I am peaceful. Yeah, it was very interesting to listen to my colleagues on the statement made by Sir Sanjay about the ears, uh, two ears and uh, two eyes, but I think the one has become dominant and the other one subdominant. But what Rachel mentioned regarding consumption caught my attention. I think that's a very critical point uh, you made. And that reminds me of a principle that uh, mind operates on. That is the input-output principle. What you put inside the bottle comes out. If you put water inside, water comes out. If you put alcohol inside, alcohol comes out. So what you put in comes out. But the question is still, uh, Dr. Andre, uh, Audrey, right, Audrey? She was talking about micro and macro level of management simultaneously. I think what is essential for us right now to understand there are two variables to peace. And managing these two variables are critical for sustainable development through interfaith harmony. And I say this consciously and intentionally because the two variables are one is intelligence and the other one is emotions. These are the two variables that if not corrected or tamed or educated becomes violent, disturbed, and inherently critical of the immediate surrounding. And you know, there was a statement made by uh, Immanuel Kant. He said, reason is like a harlot. You give an inch to it, it'll be destructive. Albert Einstein discovered the easy to E is equals MC squared for peaceful purpose. But ultimately what happened, they used that very formula for a non-peaceful course of action. So if the mind is not evolving itself to be controlled by something that is higher than itself, then it's self-destructive. The second variable, emotions. Emotions is very slippery. And uh, if we don't have that emotional quotient controlled, we cannot survive and sustain peace. And today, my 
for earlier question, Rachel, that I mentioned, the missing link of curriculum is what? Integration. And we are not able to give a key how to manage the intelligence, how to manage our emotions, and therefore we land, landed up in world wars. And Hitler's teacher taught a lesson in history saying Jews were not good people. So that biased thought processes was in Hitler's mind. And he, he nurtured that wrong thinking throughout his life, and he became one of the most uh, uh, great leaders of military and destroyed six million Jews because of one teacher who taught historically something that is incorrect. So a, a prejudice of a teacher led to genocide of six million Jews. So uh, what am I saying here? Intelligence have to be managed. Emotions have to be managed. So IQ is not enough. EQ is not sufficient. We need a BQ to control the IQ and the EQ. And that is missing in curriculum today. And as an educated person, I want to say, as a learner in education, I should say, that today's curriculum should integrate this characteristic of BQ into the IQ and the EQ of our curriculums. If we do so, we will enhance the sustainability of development and all religious leaders who are seated here, I think this challenging thought should come to us that the emotional quotient and the intelligent quotient cannot be managed by us. It has to have a higher power that governs the demands of reason and the expectations of the emotions. So the consumption uh, principle that Rachel was talking about cannot be possibly managed because there is no governing principle given outside that. And I was reading a newspaper cutting yesterday, uh, the editorial, it's a very interesting observation. I think it uh, correlates to what I'm just talking about. It says, economic and social change have missed the centrality of meaningful education and work. And if growth of the market and the infrastructure are unaccompanied by educated imagination of the prospect of employment, the social ethos cannot sustain the norms and morality it once prized. So my concluding thought, to Rachel, as a moderator, I want to say that the missing link of modernity, postmodernism, is the BQ. And the BQ must be put in its place and its role and responsibility. And for us as an August group, we must reaffirm the BQ to manage the IQ and the EQ. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, we're going to transition to questions after I give our panelists a chance to say anything that's been unsaid. And let me caveat this by saying that this is a panel. <laughs> this is not a holistic, end-all conversation about peace building and social peace. So there are things we've left out. And there are groups of people that we have failed to represent. It's not personal. It's a time constraint. So if you are thinking about a specific group, please raise that in your questions or a specific point. We're just going to go through everyone now and give everyone a chance. Any final thoughts about this topic or what's been shared? Thank you to everyone for your thoughts. And then we'll immediately go to questions, so prepare for those. And if we can get the roaming mic ready to go. So starting again on this end, one final time for any final thoughts that you want to contribute to the conversation. As this panel is also relating to interfaith, you know, what I believe that the modernization theories of secularization and westernization, you know, on the 20th century, they say that religion will cease to have any importance in the society as the society is, you know, there's a lots of churning and changing on, you know. But what we have seen along with these issues of, you know, social peace or peace building, other things. There is a resurgence of you know, religious movements and popular movements and there are popular government coming one after another. And there are lots of, you know, every country within their own specific you know, domain try to assert its own identity. And even if they are not telling that they are a religious society, th this trend is on increase, you know. So I think, you know, 
we also have to visualize, and this is how, you know, the leadership theory says, you know, what remains, you know, to uh, this Richik Sonak to say that I am a Hindu, you know, while he is, you know, celebrating Diwali. And, and you know, this Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, the Republican candidate, he says that I am Hindu, I am proud of that. Because this sense gives credibility to an individual leadership that at least, you know, whatever religion he may be, he at least has certain values and this is now, the, the, the whole circle is, you know, coming to an end now, you know. This churning and this resurgence of religion vis-a-vis -vis of, you know, the hostility increasing among the society, I think within this parameter of peacemaking and peace building, we'll also have to address this, you know. We need to have enlightened religious leaders to whom the people have credibility and, you know, respect, you know. I think there's a need to educate our religious leaders to understand this dynamics so that because, you know, I can foresee that in the future we will have more conflict, you know, it started with Huntington, you know, that is you know, a clash of civilization. And then, you know, we can see the end of civilization, no, but they, they, this is a very dangerous theory and this is now coming to our front, you know. I think in case we have to address this peace building and peacemaking, I think the underground currents, which is percolating down, and because of poverty and, you know, illiteracy, you know, not being given their credit, you know, and, you know, sustainability. I think, you know, 17th and 18th, we are going to have Sustainable Development Goals Conference in New York, you know. And the results are very alarming. July 2023 report says that we have not been able to cover even 50% of the goals, you know. I think sustainability, confidence in the system, and this again, you know, churning of social mobility along with religious, you know, percent, you know, in it is very dangerous and we'll have to understand and address it. Thank you for particularly highlighting the local context. Yes. India is a leader for many reasons. One of the reasons India is a leader is because when things happen here, they're also happening around the world. And the way India responds, the world watches what's going to happen. So you've highlighted when religion becomes part of national rhetoric and when religion actually divides instead of and unites. This is a trend which is increasing. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah, it's not specific to India. I am really mindful today, especially of Manipur and what's happening in the north. Another example of where religion, ethnicity, identity essentially divides. And instead of thinking about peace and crossing differences. It's a story of revenge. It's a story of bodies being abused uh, instead of p bodies being used as peace. So I'm, I'm really sensitive to all those issues, especially today, here in India, we're here. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, final comments, continuing. <laughs> I wish there were any final comments. <laughs> but uh, it's wonderful to share uh, you know, such uh, diverse opinions and uh, a different focus from micro to macro to culture and other things. But I was just thinking that where are we today? I mean, one odd thing comes to me that peace is uh, not so much about the past as it about the present and the future. Past we can learn. We can learn if the so-called dictums, the uh, uh, proposals, the ideas that we are talking about, have they helped in past? We can take constructive lessons from history and to see what, what, where are we today. Now today, in 21st century, we, if we just look back one century ago, 20th century begins the two world wars and thereafter United Nations comes in being and uh, as people are euphoric that uh, UNESCO is since course spring in the minds of now we are saying humans, men is <laughs> not <laughs> good enough. And then there's a resolve that, well, there'll be collective security all for one for, nothing happened. 20th century turns out to be the deadliest century of the entire annal of our history and civilization. And of that 20th century, the last decade of post-Cold War last decade was the deadliest. But is 21st century any better? No worse. Today, and I'm, apart from my 
peace studies and conflict resolution. I'm a very trained scholar in international security studies. Sorry to uh, you know, flag my career. But I can tell you with conviction that today the world is under the greatest and severe most threat of an annihilation. I mean, if you look at the situation, I think at no point in the last few decades we were so anxious and insecure. There is no consensus, no midpoints. It's only alignment and alignment and alignment. So this is a deadly situation. So what do we do? Micro, macro, yes, but is the inner peace? Do we think that by changing people's mind we will change? Can anybody change the mindset of Putin or for that matter Biden? Or can anybody change? See, it's a complex thing why people take to violence, why people take to war. It's not simply a mindset. There's a set of things, there are economic factor, business factor, and history tells us us. But what do we do? Where do we go? As I said, future. So United Nations is one quorum. I mean, people do criticize. Somebody talked about UNESCO. I don't know, a very strange kind of argument I heard. UNESCO, like UNESCO, is one of those most powerless institution in UN system. And this is something that their DG, I mean, I work very close with them, not sitting here. Their DG also admits that who listens to us? But at least they are throwing in some ideas, some, you know, something to think about. And I take some leaves from there. 25 years back, 20 years back, they gave this idea of culture of peace. Because why? Individually, we can be very peaceful. So this culture of peace is very sort of comprehensive idea. And middle of that culture of peace is the idea of transformative education and transformative peace education, for instance. Because it is education through education that you can bring about fundamental changes and differences. And then on, as if it was not enough, they were the first one to realize that religion is becoming more and more conflictual. We are here to talk about interfaith. But there is a realization that today 85% of our conflict and violence is because of ethnic or religious components. Even Manipur is no exception, let me tell you that. And so then they came out with the idea of rapprochement of culture. But then do we know all about it? How many of us know, for instance, that 22 was the culmination of a 10 year long process of rapprochement of culture? IRD as they call it, nobody. Because once again, power and knowledge, what gets more primacy, what gets more important in people's discussion? National security, yes. War, yes. Animosity, yes. So all these ideas, that we don't have dearth of ideas. And today I'll tell you, the peace building is poised in a very instructive and interesting point, definitionally. There is a very clear cut realization that peace is all about SDGs. Peace is not simply about absence of violence. It is about food, it is about hunger, the SDG one. It is, you know, the 16th goal is connected to all goals. So we have all these targets before us. And then there is also a realization, as I said, uh, that preventive diplomacy, you can prevent if you cannot prevent a conflict, if you cannot foresee it coming, there'll be very little that you can do once it assumes that alarming proportion. So these are some of the ideas. And I'll just come to one more point. And of course, within that, the idea of nonviolent communication has germinated. It was Gandhian idea, but now people are talking about nonviolent communication, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing with which I'll uh, you know, end is that there is also a very strong realization that uh, this uh, inter-religious dialogue, as we prefer to call it here, as compared to interfaith dialogue, for reasons, and I have uh, my <laughs> grounds to tell you how I think <laughs> I, I, I fa interfaith was more popular and acceptable in Abrahamic religion, but in our part, we did IRD. So there is a lot that is happening, and I would bring the attention of young people especially. There are a lot of international NGOs, we call them FBOs also, faith-based organization, right, Religions for Peace. Eza Karam didn't come, and she's the one who led it for many years. Then Temple of Understanding, Mr. Barchant is here, Dr. Karan Singh uh, is one leader, he has been, see these, are, you know, religion for peace, then I think URI is there, very dominant kind of initiatives are there, at micro level also, ma'am, they are there, there are efforts, wherein I think young people should join hands. It's if we expect the states to do one thing, something transformative, it is not happening. 
the civil society has the potentials. And very rightly, as one of the theologians said, Hans Kung, that if there, is, there has to be a peace among nations, it has to be peace between religions. And if it, if it is the peace among religion that is important, the only way out is inter-religious dialogue or interfaith dialogue. So Beautiful. it is interfaith dialogue, I think, that holds the key. And this, and there I end here, this is not simply meeting of the usual suspects, as we call it, the leaders. It is everyday life, interfaith dialogue, amongst everyday, and this is a category. A lot of people have described it. So in everyday life, you see it. I come from the city of Varanasi, the holy city of Varanasi, which is at the first go, people look at as a Hindu city, but no, it's a gathering place of all religions, 3,000 temples, 1,500 shrines and all, and I can go endlessly. And there you see the examples of this everyday life when people participate in each other's culture, rituals, and so on and so forth. So this fear of anonymity is limited. We do not have the situation like what we have in Manipur. What unfortunately is happening, and let me say rather boldly, that world over, the leaders prefer the policy, colonial policy of divide and rule. The ethnicities, the language, the religions, instead of bringing them together, we look at their voting potential, as somebody said. We look at how we can use the instrumental approach. That has to be thought about, that has to be fought together. And I think the young generation, I have this one thing to say, my dear, peace is pragmatic. It's not euphoric. Yeah. If you don't aim for it, there will be no good life for all of us here. Well we said. to work every day. Every day life. Well said. Thank you. You know what I love about final comments? is you can tell how much these panelists care. Can you feel it? Can you feel the, I can feel the passion. And it is about youth, but it's also about standing on the shoulders of giants. So if you're in this room and you're over 40, you need to find someone to mentor. If you're under the age of 40, you need to find an elder to learn from. It's gonna take all of us. <laughs> and yes, we need youth, but we also need the people who have survived the conflict, the people who have survived years of peace building, it's gonna take every one of us. Peter, your final comments, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't think also in the interest of time, and so we have some questions, I will give you my final comments as such, but I will share with you a challenge, which is also easy for me. I can depict a problem area and I don't have to come up with solutions. So what I do worry about um, is basically how can we capture the lessons learned I've been to quite a number of meetings like this in over, over the number of years, and I often hear great case studies, uh, great um, success stories, and so on. But how actually, if you not happen to be in that room, how do we share with each other ex across the globe our lessons learned? Secondly, if we have recommendations coming out of, of meetings like this, um, how, do we, how actually do we implement those recommendations and can we follow it up? And thirdly, how do we measure then the success of any implementation we do? Each of those are very complicated questions and non-trivial to answer. I'm not too worried about the macro level. We keep coming back to the macro and the mi mi micro. For example, here we are clearly part of um, a feeding in mechanism into the G20. So that's not my main worry. Here we have a mechanism in place, but more at the micro level. If you, at, on, on the local ground, want to set up um, an interfaith dialogue and so on and so forth, what are the, uh, the models from across the world which come to you? What are the success stories? To who do you reach out? And how can we more structure that? I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you so much. So I want uh, to share that the United Nations Human Rights Council has actually indicated that peace is a sacred right. And I think that is a very interesting juxtaposition of peace and sacred. So the Human Rights Council has reaffirmed that the peoples of this planet have a sacred right to peace. And it reaffirms that the preservation of the right of all peoples to peace and the promotion of its implementation constitute a fundamental obligation of the state. So they are imposing this obligation upon all member states to be able to preserve the rights of the people to pe have peace. It also stresses the importance of peace for the promotion and protection of all human rights, human rights for all. 
And so this is very important because it directly addresses the judicial processes, the rule of law, um, and all of the you know, instruments that have been created, truth and reconciliation commissions that have examined what goes haywire in society, in conflict situations that seek to have redress and the adjudication of justice. And what does that justice look like after we have heard the uh, you know, fact-finding uh, commissions and their research work what does it look like when we have heard testimony from witnesses who have experienced um, the inhumanity of war and man's inhumanity to man? And so the legal process is very important because it is the adjudicator of what is truth and finding the evidence and the facts and ultimately trying to render justice. Now that is going to be contextually relevant from culture to culture, country to country, village to village. And so we always have to take into consideration what is the experience of the local people or the country in the totality of the lack of peace. And it also uh, stresses the deep fault lines that divides human society between the rich and the poor and the ever increasing gap between the developed world and the developing world. And it recognizes that this poses a major threat to global prosperity, peace, human rights, security, and stability. So here we have the economic infrastructures as someone had previously mentioned and the examination and analysis of the economic infrastructures that we have created that has ultimately not translated into well-being. And if you look at the SDGs themselves, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, they use the GDP as the objective indicator of growth, of progress. But it is an economic model that while it's supposed to be objective, does not necessarily translate its application to well-being. So all of these things need a deeper critique and analysis to ascertain whether or not the infrastructures that we have created ultimately creates well-being for humanity. And to the extent that it has created these disparities it perpetuates power dynamics of the powerful being able to oppress and keep marginalized people of color, women, uh, the gender disparities. Then we have to also look at how these power dynamics are applied within ourselves and society as a whole. So here again is that eternal tension of the pairs of opposites going hand in hand, and our ultimate goal is to find transcendence that goes beyond the pairs of opposites. And in the beautiful text of Vedanta, it is ultimately Advaita Vedanta that we want to embrace, and that is to come to that state of non-duality. So thank you very much. Thank you for your wisdom. Sanjay? Yeah. Try and uh, let's take these last two, two minutes, three minutes, so we can get to some questions. Yeah, you can stop me. <laughs> Men are shocked at the lack of rain. Some are furious at irregular train. Some frustrated in their gambling game. I conclude my comment with peaceful brain. In Sanskrit, there is a saying, Raja Kalasya Karanam, that is the king is supreme. What the world lacks today that the common man, common people, they are not in the position to control the king. And it is the game of king's mind. Those are going for wars and violence. So one thing is Raja Kalesh Karanam, the king is supreme, that we have to think. Second thing is Shastrena Rakshite Rashtre Shastra Chinta Pravartate. It's a Sanskrit saying. It means that the more you discuss, the more you make a topic complicated. And Shastra Chinta Pravartate, so worries are in increase if you talk more on the same topic again and again. So we have to go for the actual action. And that actual action, as I 
say that uh, we have to trust everyone, we have to make everyone happy, unless and until you do that, you cannot attain peace. Now, one conclusion is 100% that we have to establish peace on Earth before we get human species on Mars. Thank you. Thank you. Bring it home. Final comments. Uh, I want to draw three conclusions uh, to our discussion, at least for the areas that I have been talking about. Peace education is critical for sustaining peace. That's my first conclusion. Second conclusion is development of peace curriculum has to be the job of educators and policy makers and religious leaders, teachers and technocrats and media personnel to come together in the formulation of that curriculum because an integrated approach in the curriculum is probably a paramount because we want an all sustaining peace for a world peace as well. These are my three conclusions that I want to draw from my discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to take three questions all in a row and then we'll respond to those as a group. So questions from the audience. Yes, right here. I'll do here, here, and then uh, Justin, you'll take the third question. so much for this very enriching uh, discussion that brought us from macro, micro, and several levels. I want to build on um, something that I was touched upon, and Rachel, you mentioned, which is um, identity politics, and particularly in relation, what I believe identity politics have helped raise the voices of marginalized groups, I think it has been used by populist uh, discourses and narratives to advance nationalistic agendas. That excludes the other. And that, when those groups are in power, create structures that are violent, that are, just, that are justified violence, and structures and systems that are normalized. And I see this is happening in many parts of the world, very close to us at this moment, and in many, uh, in many uh, locations. And my question to the panelists is about structural violence. When that happens, and structures and systems and very subtly uh, laws and policies are created to deliberately exclude the other. It is very difficult to, to change. In polarized societies, and I come from Colombia, very polarized society, this is very difficult to, to change and to build peace. So how can we, and mobilizing the interfaith community, address the structural violence? And I am a firm believer of education. I work on education. education will take us long term, but I think we cannot uh, rely on the long term when at the short term we are creating more divisive and violent societies. Thank you. Okay, second question here. I want to flag uh, this issue uh, because uh, nobody has perhaps touched upon the world military expenditure. Uh, last year, 2022, it was $2.2 trillion, with 40% of that share being that of the United States of America. So uh, the world military expenditures uh, means the world military industrial complex, the military industrial complex, they are the one actually who determine where there should be the next conflict or the next war. <laughs> because for them, the war in Europe, every second of that is being photographed and every machinery, every missile, every rocket that's fired is being studied about its lethality and effectiveness. Why would America be interested in doing trade with India? Because they saw all these decades, they missed out selling arms to India because Russia, Soviet Union was selling to us. <coughs> now they realize we have lost billions of dollars. India is the largest buying of arms. Yeah, very so very at the important. macro level, that's the issue. And since UNESCO has been mentioned many times, I also work in the area of education. UNESCO gave us an education curriculum framework for the 21st century, anchored upon the four pillars of learning. Yes. And a lot of the governments incorporated a good portion of that into the national curriculum framework, but worldwide had the majority of the world's people and the political leadership accepted that. Yes, it's an ex have learned excellent point. What is Wh the learning for knowledge, uh, learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to be. 
Beautiful. The four pillars of learning what, at what the is micro your, level. What is your question for the panel? So my question is that we cannot resolve, uh, first of all, at the macro level, unless and until you resolve this issue about military industrial complex, our uh, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction Kay. will only become more and more accentuated and yeah. we are just 90 seconds from doomsday <laughs> according to the security board of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Yes, we've Every been year in the month of January, they adjust the doomsday clock. Perfect, okay, we've got your question. Thank you. Last question in the back, please. On this side, I saw one. Thank you, Rachel, I'll make it quick. Uh, Rachel, you kind of talked about the development of the word peace through the centuries as fasten, agreement, reconciliation, and freedom. Do you panelists believe that the word freedom will continue to develop throughout the years? And if so, what will it eventually form into? Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yes, in the blue shirt here. As it has been discussed that in UNESCO, in UNESCO preamble, was begins in mind at micro level. Then we have discussed the Gandhian philosophy of structural violence, that is hunger, discrimination, and child labor. My question is that what we can do to protect such people who are suffering from hunger, discrimination, and child labor, for example, a child whose intelligence and emotional state of mind is still in developing process but they are suffering due to the act of someone else. So is there any procedure or is there any way to stop this kind of things in the developing mind of the children so that it would, it would bring the peace in future? Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, so panelists, you can respond. I'm not, we're not gonna go in order, we won't have time. Let's just take a few people who want to respond to the first question, which is, how do we mobilize the interfaith community to address structural violence? Anyone want to respond to that briefly? Okay, go ahead. Uh, already there are efforts afoot. We need to be more aware of these initiatives as I mentioned in pause. Uh, there are a lot of uh, such, uh, as I say, RNGOs, FBOs we call it, and even at the level of United Nations agencies, there is something known as IATF that is an inter-agency cooperation between such uh, UN agencies like uh, UNDP, UNESCO, UNFPO and all, which focus on issues like hunger, education, situation of women and other things. So in telling, creating a practical awareness about them and also kind of streamlining what policies can be uh, sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, geared up to in go in that direction. So we need to be firstly aware of the initiatives. There are a lot of young people's initiatives also in this field. Am I supposed to just address this one or some other question? Let's just go with that one for now. Yeah. I'll just add one other comment on this. Um, it's very difficult and you need to find people who are in this work for the long, long run and not just in this work for ego. And that's difficult to find, but once you discern that difference, you will find organizations that care about Columbia and structural violence. Find them, recruit them, and with them will come resources, a renewed energy, a renewed focus. I think a lot of what we need to do in the world today is not find new information. It's sifting through an overload of information. It's sifting through to find where are the groups that are, that are successfully addressing structural violence. Do I have someone in my network who can make a connection? And that's where it begins. And I'm happy to help you with that because I really care about that and that's something we're addressing at Bellwether International. Okay, second question. How do we address the rising uh, global expenditures, uh, particularly on military infrastructures and seeking out conflicts abroad? Any of the panelists want to speak briefly to that? I have a very strong curiosity to know uh, in the United States when we come to know here that uh, uh, it's a free uh, sale of weapons in the shops and the kids are uh, uh, having those weapons in their hands and uh, they shoot anyone. I have seen one clip where uh, a neighbor got angry uh, just to, just on the topic of removing the ice uh, accumulated in front of his door. And there, uh, there was a fight and he went inside, brought the gun and uh, shot both the uh, couple. I, I, I feel that is the basic need. From there only, as you rightly said, we have to 
United States, if it, they are the leaders of the society right now, they have to take this action to ban these shops immediately, selling weapons to anyone at any time. Thank you. And let me just also add, since we're in the world's largest democracy, I cannot stress enough that in a democracy, the government works for you. And if you undervalue the power that you have to hold your representatives responsible, it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Take your passion and your anger on these issues to the polls. Your country and the United States, which I can speak to, both have major elections coming up. One of the most important peace building exercises you can do is to rally your community to take your opinions to the polls. So do not take that for granted. As soon as we do, we don't have a democracy. Okay, next question. Will freedom continue to evolve? And is our definition of freedom essentially changing as time progresses? Any panelists who want to comment on that? Um, let's go to Audrey. Yeah, you go. Will freedom continue to evolve? Well, since we live in an open system, and there is never ever a closed system because consciousness itself is infinite and is ever growing in the infinite field of possibilities. So freedom, of course, uh, continues to grow and develop. And you know, there was a time when um, Chris Christopherson wrote that freedom is another word for nothing left to lose. And that was made very famous in his song, Bobby McGee, which Janis Joplin turned into an international hit. So freedom in that sense can be having nothing to lose. So you're free. You're afraid of losing nothing because you have nothing. And so that also, however, is a very deep uh, spiritual concept as well. So Lord Buddha said non-attachment because everything in the external world is always changing. And so it's all impermanent anyway. So what do you consider to be freedom? Freedom in the sense of a spiritual awakening to the reality of who you are. Freedom to have the financial wealth so that you are not you know, bound by anything. You can buy anything you want, but is that a kind of freedom or is that a kind of enslavement to materiality? So yes, freedom is going to have the definition a change according to the perspective, the life experiences, and the sacred journey that we are all individually on as well as collectively on. So yes, will freedom continue to change and grow and develop into new frontiers? Yes, we're always pioneers into new frontiers. And at some point in time, they considered space to be the new frontier, and at all times, the real frontier is within ourselves. Thanks, and I'll just add to that. I, I predict that two things are gonna happen. The first is that, and we're already seeing this, there will be a wave of individualism where truth becomes relative, identity politics prevail. But I also predict a second thing, and that is no individual can survive alone in the world. And there will actually be a wave that counters that, which is, returning to deeper truths that permeate individualism and come back to what it means to be human. And what it means to be human is to be part of human race, part of humankind. So I think freedom in the long run will reflect eternal truths that can't be changed by politics, trends, or fads. Freedom will be the thing that if we embrace humankind, uh, is what lasts the longest. It's the truth that lasts the longest we value most. Okay, last question. Uh, Let's can I, can I, I'm very tempted to add just one line to very this quickly, freedom yes. debate. Uh, you see, there are many, many frameworks which kind of relates to this uh, freedom discourse. One I'd like to mention, it, and it is popular, it's available everywhere, Google and uh, books, is human security discourse. It talks about two types of freedom. Freedom from fear, and freedom from want. So that, that has been a new addition to this. Freedom from what? Freedom from want, freedom from fear. Just it, it's yeah, a human thank security you. discourse. Very, very helpful. Again, I encourage you to talk to all the panelists after our session. The last question was, 
What about the here and now? What about the millions of people who are starving, the people who are suffering from child labor, sexual exploitation? Let's just take a moment together in this room to stand in solidarity with those people. We are very mindful of them. And it would be indecent and improper of us to go through this entire conference without acknowledging the privilege that we have to sit at this table and talk about these issues instead of suffering through those atrocious things. What about the here and now? This is the most difficult question. If we had an answer, we would have implemented the solution. But let me encourage you by going back to what I said earlier about living in a world of information. I am convinced, I don't know a lot of things with certainty, but this I know with certainty, that we have all of the tools and all of the knowledge that we need to solve these problems. The challenge is discerning what resources you have and discerning what resources are available to you. So if you are a global citizen and you care about some of these larger issues, I'm gonna challenge you to do something. Find all of the organizations that operate in your community, your nation, or your region that are funding projects to address those issues and contact them. I'm telling you, I run a nonprofit. I'm the CEO of Bellwether. And what I love nothing more is when people on the ground reach out to me and say, this is what we need. It's a service you already provide. Will you work with us? I never say no to that email. I never say no. And again, nonprofits are publicly owned. You are the leaders of the nonprofit space and of the government. So be resourceful. Be resourceful. Don't recreate the wheel. Try and sift through and discern what resources and knowledge we already have. I can tell you right now, the difference between a leader and a follower is not where they were born, is not how rich they are, it's how resourceful they are. And when they acknowledge the resources that they have, they use them. Anyone want to add anything to the final question about here and now? One sentence. Yes, Should one I? sentence, go ahead. Yeah, one sentence. <laughs> no. The prosperity and knowledge should travel like an air. When we find the low pressure area, the, the high pressure area air goes on its own to replenish the black lock there. So likewise in the human psychology also, we should be in a position to before anybody instructs us or suggests us on our own, we should travel like an air and go and re replenish that area where that backlog is there, and that is the solution. Thank you. Okay, we're revisiting the challenge. How many of you, of you have already posted something that you've learned about peace? Oh, no one! Okay, it still remains my challenge. If your phone is not out, pull it out right now, because we're going to have a statement of gratitude and then a picture of us, which is not important. Pull out your phone right now, open your social media, and be a peace builder right now in this moment. Share it with your networks because I guarantee you're the only person in your network who's sitting at this table of privilege. That's where it starts. That's my challenge. Now that I see everyone's phones out, put them down for 10 seconds to clap with me for these incredible panelists in our panel today. Okay, now go back to posting while we wrap things up. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would like to invite Dr. Mandar Bapat, sir, to give us the word of thanks. Thank you, Vedan. Uh, I know I am standing between you and your tea, so I'll uh, conclude uh, in short. A very warm uh, afternoon to all. It's my privilege to have been uh, asked to propose the vote of thanks. An amazing session we had on the peace, actually, it's, uh, I would say it's a peaceful afternoon with uh, enriching knowledge, different perspectives, ideas, solution we had. And uh, uh, MIT, I think it's a first ever uh, university to have these kind of sessions, which are really going to help us in future. Our sincere and earnest thank to all the eminent speaker who spoke uh, in panelist uh, and uh, who graced the occasion by taking their valuable time from their busy schedule 
and it was a wonderful enlightening enlightened session we all had today on this special topic a big thank you to audience as well a very uh, eager audience we had today and it is from student to faculties we have everyone here in the audience so thank you very much audience uh, for uh, especially afternoon session is very difficult to follow. Uh, I once again thank to everyone joined here, right from the photographers to our technical team. They have done a wonderful job to catch everything, what, whatever happened today. And everyone's contribution has made this session a successful one. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I request all the distinguished dignitaries to please come together for the group photograph. <laughs>